Accurate, diverse stories in the media are critically important. SRC Partners is a full-service cultural production firm. From development to market, we provide expertise on diversity and inclusivity. You will reach a much wider audience when they feel heard. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Non-Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. I'm Ruhi, and I'm a cultural producer and co-founder of SRC Partners, and we're so excited to be producing this panel. Rethinking the way Muslims are portrayed in media and entertainment with Pass the Mic Media. Now, please welcome our moderator, Zahir Ali, who's a senior fellow at the Pillars Fund. Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Uh, welcome to the Not Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. Um, I am your host, Zahir Ali, senior fellow at the Pillars Fund, a foundation that harnesses the resources within American Muslim communities in order to create a more just, equitable, and inclusive society. At Pillars, I co-lead the Muslim Narrative Change Cohort, a group of brilliant Muslim artists, practitioners, academics, and thinkers working together to create a transformative narrative strategy to change the stories told by and about Muslim communities. It is my honor to be speaking with Sue Obeidi, Sami Khan, Sahar Jahani, and Amir Suleiman for what we hope will be a thought-provoking conversation on rethinking the way Muslims are portrayed in media and entertainment. We would like to give special thanks to the team at Non-Obvious Company for organizing this panel, made possible with the partnership and support of SRC Partners. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and reflect upon the history of the indigenous lands we call home. While we are meeting today on a virtual platform, all of us occupy spaces that carry the powerful legacies of these diverse peoples and their unique local cultures. Through this acknowledgement, we reaffirm a deep commitment to improving our understanding of America's shared heritage and recognize our collective responsibility to improve the bonds between all nations. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet you wherever you may be on our journey collectively towards a more diverse and inclusive society so that we may do the work together. Again, I want to welcome our panelists and I look forward to the ways our conversation can move us beyond conventional and oft discussed notions of diversity in media to more transformative ideas about fundamental narrative change. I have some lead questions to ask each of you, and I welcome all of you to chime in uh, for a free flowing chat. The portrayals of Muslims throughout the history of, and even in, in many contemporary depictions of Muslims have a lot to be desired. That said, uh, we have seen in recent years, significant progress. And part of that has been a shift in the focus from just stories about Muslims to stories by Muslims. Sahar, um, can you share with us how your journey from content developer to storyteller might help us understand the necessity of this shift and what you learned along the way? Sure, hi. Yes, I'm Sahar Jahani. I'm a screenwriter predominantly. Um, and I started out my journey at YouTube Originals, which is sort of the content arm of YouTube. Uh, it's like the Netflix of YouTube, so to speak. And I was in a very traditional role as a junior executive trying to find the stories that they would want to tell. So I would read scripts all the time. I would do, uh, you know, intern kind of stuff and, and junior things. I would do coverage, which is a very typical uh, sort of entry level career thing that you have to do. And your job is to read stories and then talk about them and say what you like about them and why this show should be made or not be made. And I was reading tons of scripts every day and just thinking to myself, where, where are the brown people? Like, where are other people? It was just consistently story after story about generally a white male or a white female. And it was uninteresting to me, to be quite honest. And um, I would read the scripts and, and think to myself, why aren't there Muslim characters? Why aren't there Muslim women? Uh, there's a few men out there, but generally nothing that represented me or nor, no characters who looked like me. 
And so it got me thinking like, why can't I do this work? Uh, who is out there that's doing this work? And part of our job was to meet other writers and creatives. We would do generals, we would do coffees. And I, I, I probably met like one or two Muslims in my entire career before I was a writer. And then just kind of said to myself, I think I have to do this myself. Like I, if I want to see the stories on screen, I, I guess I have to write them. Um, and it was sort of an ambitious uh, goal, I think. But I think the best thing about being uh, a reader is that you read content all the time. And I think the best way of learning is by reading other people's work. Um, but I also have an MFA in screenwriting. So while I was working, I was going to school uh, at the same time and then uh, wrote a pilot. Uh, I, I thought it was OK. You know, I, I was very nervous to show it to people. And when I did, I think the confidence sort of grew a little bit as 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 people were responding to it, especially my boss, who was like the head of comedy at YouTube at the time. And I was just very, very nervous. But he was like, it's good. <laughs> That's the best compliment I could have ever received from him. So uh, from there, I tried to get on a show. I tried to get on different things. And I knew Rami's show season one was coming along at Hulu. And I was just like, I got I have to I have to find a way to work on this. And um, thankfully, just through different avenues and, you know, like there's five Muslims in Hollywood now, maybe like 10 now. So we all kind of <laughs> know each other. And uh, my my script was passed along. And um, that's, you know, that that's kind of how I got in. I, I interviewed and, and I was a writer on season one and um, sort of the rest is history. I don't know how how far we want to go into that journey. But um, yeah, that was that was my path. So I welcome any of the other panelists, feel free to jump in and tell us about your experience as a storyteller or working to have more Muslims uh, telling our stories. Thank you. So I welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sue Obedi. I'm the director of the Impacts Hollywood Bureau. And I'm so grateful to be invited today. Thank you to the non-obvious company and its leaders and CRS partners and its leaders and teams um, I just wanted to just jump on what Sahar said real quick, um, but before I do, let me just quickly tell you what Impact's Hollywood Bureau does. We work in the industry overall to get narratives changed around Muslims and Islam, and we do it in a few ways, by connecting Muslim talent to, industry, um, to the industry. We consult on films and, and, and TV projects, and we also contribute our thought leadership by organizing and speaking on panels and publishing um, op-eds for the trades. But I just wanted to quickly jump on to what Sahar said because she has been part of Impact's journey. And it is really, honestly, a journey. Um, it's, it's a long journey and there's a lot of work to be done. And, and But however, I feel from my, our vantage point um, that things are looking very hopeful. And it is because the work of my my fellow panelists and and Sahar, who at when she was at YouTube, was part of our Hollywood summit, and she was a huge part of having our young leaders go through a half day tour, um, and and do a roundtable with executives. And Sahar, you remember how you know one of your biggest fans and you know that one day when you put us in that green room or or in that studio where there was a green background and and you basically you know now that you're not with youtube anymore i can say this i mean you basically gave us the keys to the kingdom and so thank you for that so i just wanted to just say even though i'm not a creative i'm not coming from that vantage point i'm act i'm an activist i'm an advocate it takes a village and i really wanted to you know just kind of single sahar out right now because She's been part of that journey for us. Sue, I love that um, it takes a village. Um, Sami, um, you've spoken about the importance of not just telling stories about communities, but telling stories with communities. And I think that's a really great way for us to move the conversation um, away from a focus just on representation of having people present to one about relationships. Tell us why it's so important for there to be relationships with Muslim communities in, in these productions from your experience. Yeah, thanks to here and thanks to all the the panelists and the you know the team for putting this together. I, I have a somewhat unusual background um, in that I work in documentary and in scripted TV, um, and you know increasingly I see how 
the two, you know, areas overlap. Um, and, you know, just to be blunt, it's the, the history of cinema with, with people of color, with, you know, with foreign nations is, uh, is a colonial lens, right? It's a it's a it's a lens where the late nineteenth century, you know, the West is sort of conquering the world and looking for images to justify it. Um, so even that acknowledgement um, is a huge step, right? Let's let's look at the way you know D. W. Griffith covered, uh, you know, represented African Americans. Let's look back to the way Asian Americans were represented as the yellow peril, you know, at the beginning of the twentieth century. And you know that's somewhere where my documentary work um, to sort of shatter that colonial lens informs my scripted work and the conversations I have, you know, with my colleagues, producers, showrunners on on the scripted side. Um, and so, I mean, one big thing I could say to you know to um, people looking to make change um, is do the work, you know, educate yourself. So it's not just up to the people of color or you know, the, the younger people in the room, the women in the room, the LGBTQ people in the room to, to educate you, do your own homework. And you know, I'm not saying you gotta read a, a history book of cinema, but look, look at the last 10, 20 years of the kinds of films that have been produced about, you know, we're talking about Muslims, about Muslims. You know, let's look at the role. Zahar was talking about how rare it is to have female Muslim characters and the male Muslim characters are very specific. And now, thankfully, you know, Rami is like shaking that up, shaking that up. Kamil Nanjani is uh, shaking that up. But how can we go further? And it's it's just it's also just bad writing, bad storytelling. You don't want to tell the same story over and over again. Um, and I think you know we're we're talking now on what is it, January twenty second, um, sort of a couple of days after the end of the Trump era. And you know, with the Trump era taught the general public maybe you know, the, the broader public is the danger of stereotypes, how stereotypes can be weaponized. Um, and I think people of color have known that for a long time. Um, so hopefully that kind of change in public consciousness helps address some of these issues. Thank you. Um, Amir, I wonder if you could jump in as I listened to Sami talk. Um, you know, we we talk about Muslims as this sort of singular community, but there's diversity within the Muslim community. And whether it's listening to Sahar talk about the need to have more Muslim women present or what Sami has just talked about, um, talk about a little bit about your journey. And, and I'm thinking especially of how you got involved with um, the program Rami as, as a writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me. And um, thank you to all the, the, the fellow guests for, um, for being here to have this conversation. Yeah, you know, in, in, in uh, Rami show, and I have to really uh, salute Rami because it wasn't something that I petitioned to get on. I didn't have, I didn't have really any, any personal previous ambition to be on the Rami show. Um, but uh, he reached out to me um, by, by way of Mahershala. Mahershala, when he was talking about filling this role, he suggested me as a, as a writer or, or at least as an advisor on the season. And so the the character of Mahershala and a, and and Mahershala's character's daughter were both very important to me um, as the really first kind of full represent what well, kind of a, a fuller characters on the show of Black American Muslim people and particularly Muslim Sufis, which is uh, which is even a further uh, subgroup and. Uh, I was happy that he wanted to get it right, that he didn't assume that he knew how to do that. And so at first he uh, brought me in as an advisor, uh, as a consultant. And so I was there uh, to visit the room, uh, really just for a couple of days. That's the, that was, and then it was like a few more days and then can you stay for a week? And then, hey, can you write this episode? And hey, can you associate produce? Can you be on set and so on and so forth. And um, and, and even this season as an executive producer and, and writer. Um, and so uh, he understood a gap in his understanding. He understood and, and uh, identified a gap in his, um, in his education. Uh, as our brother was just mentioning that even if he couldn't do enough of the education himself, 
he pulled in someone that represents that community, uh, although he's Muslim, although he's American, but even this more specific community. And so it was my, um, you know, my, my pleasure and my honor and my duty, you know, I felt a sense of duty to, as the first black American Sufi on television or film for that matter, I don't, I don't know of another one. There may be one, but I, I don't know of another one. Um, to make sure um, he didn't screw it, up, <laughs> didn't screw it up. So, so uh, we, he was very open and very receptive, and um, I just tried to, in the space and the time and the subject matter that we had, uh, try to as best as we can. You know, nothing is perfect, but as best as we can to have at least an authentic representation of these men and women that I know from my community. Like in some ways, the daughter there was based on my daughter, um, uh, Zainab, and um, many things about Mahershala's uh, character were, were derived from my, my own life and experience in Black American Sufi communities. So it was, uh, it, was, it was great to be a part of that. And I was um, happy how open and receptive uh, they were to it. You know, Amir, as I listen to you talk, um, I think that that all of our all of our panelists here occupy multiple, uh, you know, kind of locations at the same time. Um, and I wonder how you each have navigated, you know, these relationships. You know, the the kind of influence you want to have um, in the spaces that you work in, the the person that you want to be as you show up as an artist or as an advocate, and then the sort of pull on you by various constituencies or communities. You know, it's, I, I don't wanna say burden, but it's the the task of, of representation and the task of representing. And how do you sort of locate yourself as an artist or as an advocate with a very, um, you know, clear vision and navigate all of those relationships. So this is just a free, I'm, I'm interested to hear from everyone. So Sahar, why don't you go first on that? How do you navigate all of these um, interests that may be pulling on you with, along with your own a vision of what you wanna see as an artist? Yeah, it's it's so tough. It's a really good question actually. And I, I don't, I wanna caveat this by saying, I don't think I'm the only Muslim woman in Hollywood. There's, there's a lot, uh, thankfully they're coming up, um, but there's not enough right? Like there's truly not enough. I, I remember going to the Writers Guild, like orientation that they have for writers when they first become staff writers. And uh, I like looked in the directories. I've like been to the meetings. I'm like, where, where are the other Muslim women? Like, hello, I, I need friends. Um, and there's a few, but the, none that like wear visibly hijabi Muslim women, which I think is important. Um, and I say that because it, you are wearing your religion on your sleeve in a lot of ways. You can't just like blend into a background. I can't just walk into a writer's room and nobody knows like what my background is. It's very clear, um, usually why I'm there in the room. And sometimes I know that it's because I'm a Muslim woman and that voice is very much needed and I'm happy to serve that voice. But a lot of the times I also take on jobs because I don't want to be just a Muslim writer. I think there's so much more uh, to me as a person, but obviously like my Islam is like very important to me and I'm very proud of it, but I also feel like we have to move beyond the Muslim identity a little bit in storytelling. I do feel like there's a little bit of a crux, right? Like we feel like the story is about being Muslim, but it's, but that's not story. Like if you pitch that to a showrunner, like they're like, okay, like what's the conflict? Like what, what makes it interesting? What is the drama? And I think we have to move a little bit beyond just I'm Muslim and I'm having issues identifying. I think that's very important. I think that that's happening and those stories are happening, but my interest lies in like telling really entertaining, dramatic, emotional stories. Like, you know, I, that just happened to be about Muslim characters. They just happened to be there and that's their experience, but we're not spending so much time explaining why they make choices. I think really storytelling gets bogged down when you have to be so ex expository about everything. So my interest lies in like moving beyond that identity. And I found myself 
continuously pitching that. Like I'm like, she's a Muslim girl and she wears hijab and she's just having issues. Like that's not interesting anymore to me, at least. I I just want to I just want to be like, all right, there's a murder and the girl who solves it is, is is Muslim and like that just happens to be her identity and like let's tell that story. So that's where that where my interests lie. But I do continuously get offered a lot of. Um, particularly young Muslim women who are struggling with an identity crisis, which is real, it happens. And I'm, I'm happy to take a look at all those things, but but I, uh, I continuously find myself getting pitched projects by executives or producers who don't happen to be Muslim. And they think that that particular story is interesting. And unfortunately, I think the power still lies in those executives and producers, and we really need people of color, we need Muslims, non-Muslims, everybody who's socially conscious to be in those positions so that those stories are no longer the only interesting thing that we're telling. Um, so that's where my headspace is at. I'm curious where everyone else is. Sami, um, Sue, so I, I wanna come to you, but Sami, um, as, as Sahar was talking about the need to have like, um, you know, a, a multi-dimensional character. I'm thinking about your work with Transplant, whose lead is Muslim, which is significant, right? Um, and how that that needs to be more than just a Muslim. Can you tell us a little bit about how that that experience has been for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, Transplant. Uh, it was. It's been an incredible journey. We're working on season two in the midst of season two, um, and uh, you know. I think that sort of it shows how uh, those stereotypes that uh, Zahar was just talking about, how the audience is sick of them too, you know? So you just like reframe things a little bit. So the hero doctor is not a guy from, no offense to Chicago, but from Chicago, he's a guy from Aleppo, Syria. Um, and, you know, you use archetype, you use, uh, you know, these conventions of the medical genre. Um, and then you tell something, a, a specific story that's authentic to the experience of Syrian refugee and an audience will embrace that. Um, so it is, I mean, it's like, it's just stereotypes are bad storytelling. They're bad, they're bad writing. Um, and, you know, I do feel a responsibility, partly it is because I do work in documentary a lot um, that, you know, there are, um, uh, obligations that I feel a sense of honor to to Muslims worldwide to tell to help tell their stories and there's just so much suffering out there whether it's the Rohingya people the Uyghur people you know the Palestinian people um, and there's so much blindness even in within the Mus Muslim community that you know I feel a responsibility to sort of drive that conversation um, but I haven't really found the sustainable balance yet. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I'm on the East Coast, we're doing this in the morning, so I have to give props to the people on the West Coast who are up at this time and sharp, because uh, I'm a little I'm a little frazzled even at, it's almost 10 o'clock, so you West Coasters, I'm, I'm in awe of you right now. Speaking of West Coast, Sue, um, yeah. you are constantly in conversations with industry folk, including what we would consider quote unquote mainstream producers, um, who may say, you know, they may want a particular kind of, you know, uh, traditional conventional portrayal. How do you nudge um, producers, especially those outside the Muslim communities? Um, how do you nudge people into shifting, you know, and, and adding multidimensionality to their work? Yeah, thank you. And I, I just wanted to say that just many golden nuggets that Sahar and Sammy just put out, and of course, Amir. And um, our theory of change at Impact is that by is that of engagement and that's the model of the prophet peace be upon him mm -hmm. he engaged with everybody and you know to make change happen within and so we do you know um engage with non-muslim producers and you know just the regular quote unquote mainstream com um, entertainment community and the question is how do we nudge them very very carefully is how we nudge them um you know we when we consult you know our number one um, goal, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, was to reduce stereotypes, right? To get scenes omitted, to get character lines changed, you know, then then Trump came along and there was such, that, believe it or not, was a silver lining for Muslims in, in, in enter entertainment because the industry 
wanted to resist the 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 administration in in one form or another and 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 it kind of showed by reaching out to um to impact who's been doing the work doing the work in the industry for some time not as creatives but as advocates and so how do we nudge them we basically tell them look we are we want to be your partners in a way to help you tell a better story for you to get it right because you know, so much is at stake. So much vilification happened in the industry uh, towards Muslims and other ma marginalized communities, obviously. And, you know, you're you're talking about life and death sometimes, you know. And so we often tell them, we go into the room and say, look, ask us anything you want. And, and you'd be surprised to know that they don't know a lot. A lot of people don't know a lot. And so we have to address those questions and, and answer them as authentically as we can. Um, but ultimately too, when we do consult, you know, we it is an opportunity to now that there's so much talent, like Sahar is saying, you know, that, that we do now take that opportunity to um, connect our writers to the, the right, to the decision makers of the production. And so, you know, that wasn't true 10 years ago. That wasn't, you know, true maybe eight years ago. It is very much true now because we have a great community of talent. Um, one of the things that we do in nudging the, the decision makers is we say, look, we're consulting on your project. We're going to give you notes, but we're not going to give you cover. So don't you dare say, well, we contacted the Muslim Public Affairs Council and they were okay with it. We're not, as people know, that we're, we're not, we're not on the streets. We're in the room, so we're not. We're not um, going to protest openly. We're going to protest privately um, to the to the networks or studios um, or whatever whoever we're consulting with. But we really walk away with, look, you're. It's an. It's. It's. We're at an age now where there's a cancel culture. Sure, you want to go with that storyline, you want to keep that scene in. It's not authentic, it's not accurate, it's not fair, it's not nuanced. And and we gave you the notes, but when it kind of like backfires, you were you were um you were advised differently. So the nudging is very subtle. The nudging is is um at least for MPAC is very subtle. Uh the what's the con the consequence for them is you know, are they telling a better story? Are they telling the correct story, authentic story? And with our, you know, with our conversation, they walk away with, well, you know what, maybe we're not doing the best we can. That's been our experience. I'm not saying that's been everybody's experience. I know Sammy, you know, you, we did a webinar for Transplant a few months ago, and, you know, you and um, Hamza got pushed back from one of the viewers about you not being Syrian or you know Arab, and that's a healthy, healthy conversation to be had, right? Five years ago, we might have not even had that conversation. Five years from now, we probably won't be because I, I am very hopeful. But you know, so so it's ever evolving. Progress is ever evolving, and what was true five years ago is not true today and won't be true in five years. Sue, so I, I wanna stay with you um, and then get responses from the other panelists. Um, you have developed uh, a test um, and, I, I, and I wanna ask the question, how do we know we're being successful? How do we know we're having the kind of impact um, and actually shifting that we'd like to see? So Sue, can you introduce us uh, to that uh, that yeah. subject with the talking about the the metrics that you have set up, and then I want to hear other uh, panelists' uh, assessments. Right. Yes, and the test, by the way, was co-founded by um, Evelyn, Dr. Evelyn El Sultani, who is a professor at USC. And the reason um, we wanted to create the test was because of the evolution of the industry. Um, we again are not where we used to be ten years ago. Five years ago, we were very, you know, excited when um, we saw ourselves on, you know, in commercials, um, or when we had a positive character on a TV series or a film. You know, it, the 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 wins were very um, small, if you will. You know, and so the test was born out of the evolution of where uh, Muslim creatives you know, are of these days. And it was it was a testament really to Sahar and Amir and Sammy's of the world and, and Yuza here and 
all the all the creatives and and business people who are who identify as Muslim and who are in the industry. So that test was born out of the the progress. And so we thought, you know, there was a risk test. There's a risk test, and the risk test is fine. Um, but the risk test was fine almost. And and it's not to negate the risk test, but it was fine like five years ago, you know, eight years ago. But we've come a long way because of the talents of our of the panelists, and so we just wanted to create another test. By no means is it the one and only test. It was just something we came up with, um, where we are in, in in the present time, and it's ever evolving, just like progress is. And you know, one thing about the Muslim Public Affairs Council is that we do take you know stop engage you know you know you know that saying if you if you don't have a goal you can't score and so we're always taking those temperature checks what's what's the next thing what's the ne next success we want to attain we want to work our way out of the consulting business i i mean that is how the industry was born and that's why we did the hollywood summit and that's why we do our screenwriting labs and that's why we do our panels because ultimately we don't want to consult we want the storytellers to be telling stories, uh, you know, like you said, Zahir, not about, but by, you know, is 100% authorship realistic? Anything is possible. We're, we're in a pandemic and we're all at home and we're not together. Anything is possible. And so, you know, it, it's, it's ever evolving, basically. So Sue has, has sort of introduced us into our, our actionable items as well. So as we go around getting the final thoughts from our panelists, I want you to think about um, as this conference is dedicated to go beyond conversation, what kind of actionable advice can we give the audience members and how they can work to create a more inclusive world? And I'd, I'd like to go and start with Amir. Amir, you have been part of a pipeline program. You have um, worked within the industry as a writer, as we've, as we've talked about with Rami, but you've also produced your own work, um, you know, from drawing on your own spiritual traditions and outlook. Um, so tell us, how do you know you're being successful and what, what more can we do? What would you like to see more of as, as we move forward? Yeah, what I would uh, like to see more of uh, or my own metric, let me start there, my own uh, metric and, and tests like this, uh, what, what Sue is putting forward are great, you know, communally, and for us to kind of start to develop a um, a, a uh, agreement, generally speaking, about what direction the community is going in. Um, for myself, very individually, in my my primary art form as a poet is a very individual art form. Uh, it's not a collaborative art form as television and film, which I've later gotten into. But my my heart is always the heart of a poet. Um, and really all I'm trying to do is be um, as robustly and um, daringly myself as possible. And I think that's the route to the very, you know, the, the, the stories that we want to see. Because even, oh my God, ugh, even in a lot of contemporary Muslim art, and this is, has changed a lot over the last 10 years, um, but where Muslims just present how they think they should be Muslim, so it's it just kind of comes off more like a com like a like a commercial for Islam, and without much um, nuance, it, it it could feel cheap, you know, um, or it can feel just inauthentic. It can feel um, yeah, it just gives you the used car salesman vibes, you know what I mean. And so, but when you're just yourself and all the nuance, and, and, and sometimes when we talk about this, sometimes people, uh, they, this is, this idea is presented as like displaying all, everything that's wrong with you per se. That's not even what I mean either. So it's not so much that, oh, I, I drink or I do this thing or I do that thing. I do all this haram stuff. And so like, I'm this nuanced Muslim person, you know what I mean? That's corny to me as well. Um, but just um, trying in myself all the time, trying to find a language that most identifies with who I am and where I am in this moment today, um, and this second, um, and this now. And when I'm able to do that, I find that that work communicates very powerfully to the heart of the listener. And so if the, the deeper that I dig into my own heart, the deeper I can reach in the heart of, the, of my audience. And that's something I learned um, at a young age. And I've just 
only sought to develop that and cultivate that as a poet, but then also bringing that into screenplay and, and, and screen, writing for screen and in and, and writers' rooms uh, for, for television is digging into those, to those deep recesses in myself and see what comes out because all of, all of us will come within a, an authentic story by default. You know, that's the, um, that's the work if we're actually true to ourselves. And uh, I think for Muslims to get out of certain tropes that even Muslims like to write about Muslims, to get out of that is is easier or, um, by just trying your best to be true. But it's not just a work that only happens when you're sitting in front of the computer. It's to really try to be an authentic person and be sincere. And this is one of the great ambitions of any person trying to follow the way of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, trying to be a true Muslim is to have sincerity and if, and cultivating that sincerity in all of your interactions. When you sit down at the keyboard, um, then it, it, it comes forward because you practice it. So really taking it as a lifestyle, as a way of life, um, and then it very naturally and beautifully in a very nuanced um, way can flow into our work, hopefully. That's the that's that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Um, Sahar, as, as I listen to Sue and as I listen to Amir, um, I wonder how, if, if you were, as, as you listen to people, as, as people in the audience are listening to us, what can people do to, to make and facilitate space for people to be that authentic self, to, to express themselves authentically, to, to write authentically. You yourself talked about not wanting to be boxed in. So how what, what do we need people to do to open up the box? And, and how do we measure whether or not that's been done? How do we know it's being done? Yeah, you, you asked really great questions. Uh, I'm gonna keep it in the context of like television because that's the world that I know. Um, and I think, it's allowing for other things to exist uh, in in a space that is is very new, and I that's very vague. But but I think it's it's about uh, if, if if there are executives or producers watching this, I think it's very important to to not consider like oh just because there is a show about Muslims out there, uh, we're done. Like we're good. Like we're set for life. Uh, I think a lot of the 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 trouble like I'm personally having with storytelling is that um, if I pitch something, it's it's always compared to what is out there and and what already exists. And there's this sense that like there can't be two of the same thing or that it's too similar. And that's because we we are so limited in our scope of what we're watching and what we're seeing. Um, it's it's hard. It's hard to move on from like what you know. And so I think this is a, a very vague answer, but I think it's just like being open to the idea that there's other types of Muslim representation and there's other types of storytelling. And I would just urge viewers to to be open to that and that there can be two Muslim shows and they can exist and they can be profitable. Like we have 10,000 shows about white men in comedy. Like I don't, I don't know why that's an issue, but it consistently comes up. Um, when I'm just pitching, it's like, oh, like that feels similar to, to something that's out there. And I'm like, what, what, <laughs> what is out? Like, it's so hard for me to hear that note. And I really just, you know, want to be conscious of people being open to other stuff that's out there. Um, so that's one thing. And then accessibility, I think, is another thing. Like, I have so many young Muslims, brown people, black people, people of color in general who are just like, where do I even begin? How do I even get into this industry? And I think access is like the number one problem we're having in Hollywood is, is my personal opinion in terms of like, especially right now in COVID, all the entry level jobs that you used to have, like being a PA, a production PA or an office PA, we don't have offices anymore. So those... Mm are completely dissolved. So how do we get people into these rooms, onto set? Um, because I truly do believe that once you learn the craft, once you hone it in, you can be part of that conversation. I think it's a lot harder to try and just like jump in as a um, non-Hollywood person and have that sort of success that you're anticipating. I do think it's a craft. Um, I, I personally believe you have to hone the craft and and right now that's that's sort of this like mentorship that we're lacking. Um, and I feel that I'm lacking because I've I've hit a certain wall, so to speak. So I'm like, wait, where do I where do I go from here? How do I go beyond just what I'm doing? And and I think 
I think those are ways that we can help each other is just by lifting each other up. Um, and I, I do give credit to, to Rami for hiring Muslims. Like I was one of uh, many Muslims on the show season one, and now there's a whole other slew of Muslims that I think is amazing. I think it's great to have to continuously bring people in. And I think we should do that in all all the types of projects that are out there. So just hiring Muslims, giving people a chance, I think is really key. Like if they don't have credits, if they don't have the sort of skill level, let's 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 try to help them achieve that. And how can we do that? Thank you, um, Sami. I think you might you might just get the final word on this. Um, uh, certainly not the last to be to be said on this topic. But tell me how. What would you like to see done? What can people do? And then how do we measure whether or not that's actually happening? Yeah, great question. I'll I'll, I'll do my best. Um, well, you know, I think change is made uh, at the margins. You know, there are these transformational shows, moments that sort of bring us forward. But you can really, you know, the, it's the margins where you know we're being pushed along, and it's also the margins where you can, you can, you can tell, you can sort of measure that change if you go into, you know, um, some struggling independent producer's office in the valley, um, and they've read this independent film that was produced ten years ago that you know uh, changed Muslim representation. Um, then we'll be able to measure it. Um, that said, I think there's, I, I, I'd be remiss without. Uh, acknowledging, I think there's a lot of fear with non-Muslim producers. Um, and so I have a strategy, a piece of advice for you is just engage in good faith. Uh, and Sue was talking about this earlier. Um, if you're worried about something, you know, if you operate in good faith, um, if you're, you know, so, sort of going on the journey um, with um, storytelling leading you, um, then there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and that can sort of carry you through that fear of you know, being canceled or you know, whatever that is. Um, so you know, I think that's like, a, that's like a really important uh, part of it is just operating in, in, in good faith. And I'd also say, you know, as someone who you know, looks to tell stories about social justice and you know, uh, films that are a little more challenging than the mainstream, um, I would also offer that I think there's a lot of money to be had by telling different stories. You know, as Rami showed, there's awards and acclaim to be had. Transplant is, you know, blew us away about how powerful and um, successful it would be. So, you know, on the one hand, operate in good faith, but also there is a huge market demand for stories about Muslims, we are incredibly diverse from South Asian, Arab, African American, uh, especially has been something that's been underrepresented. I have to give a shout out to One Night in Miami, which I thought was uh, a groundbreaking piece of uh, representation, not just for African Americans, but for African American Muslims. Um, so I'd encourage those producers, non Muslim producers, to, you know, it's okay to be a little bit afraid, but if you operate in good faith, you know, there are people like us out there to help you. Uh, you know, we can all, you know, tell these stories together and, you know, maybe make a living at it too. Thank you so much. And I, I want to thank all of our panelists, Sami, Sahar, Sue, and Amir. You have all been brilliant. We hope that those of you who have been watching come, came away with some answers, but even more questions because we could not exhaust this topic in the short time that we had. Um, you have been watching Rethinking the Way Muslims Are Portrayed in the Media and Entertainment. This has been part of a non-obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. Again, thank you to our panelists and thank you also to SRC Partners for helping to organize this panel. And thank you for watching. Um, we hope that you check out all the topics uh, we are covering um, in this uh, summit because we have brought together voices from all genres, genders, and geographies. Um, for more fascinating conversations like this one, please visit www.nonobviousdiversity.com. Also, our official summit hashtag is hashtag nonobviousdiversity. Thanks for joining us. I'm Zahir Ali, and remember to always stay non-obvious. <laughs>